Hey everyone, I'm Carlo from All You Can Board, and welcome to episode two of Curating My Collection. Today I'm gonna go over six games that are leaving my collection. Uh, the last time we did this, I believe I had eight that were leaving. Uh, for each of these games, I'm gonna go over kind of an overview or give you an idea of kind of what the game feels like, tell you what I do and don't like about it. I'm gonna try and mention uh, at least one or two similar games, comparable games, maybe in this case, uh, certain games that I kept rather than this in my collection. Uh, and then yeah, I'm gonna tell you why this one's leaving my collection. So um, there is a bit of a theme here, I guess, to this episode compared to the previous one. Um, I a, a big kind of reason for some of these games leaving my collection. Of these six, one of them I have barely played, but the other five I've played a lot. But um, I am going to be a dad in about six or seven weeks, and my amount of free time is going to be seriously changing. So I've had to be a little bit more aggressive with culling games from my collection. So um, most of these are great games, games that I've had a lot of fun with, but just for one reason or another uh, are no longer in the kind of must-own category. Uh, I'm not the type of gamer who likes to have games just sit on my shelf unplayed for like years at a time. So once I've played a game enough and I feel like I've kind of seen everything there is to see and don't feel like it's a must-own anymore, uh, at that point, it's kind of time for me to move on. So um, some of these games I might have bought thinking they were going to leave my collection one day. Others I might be surprised now that I, you know, years ago I might have thought they were going to stay forever. So uh, without further ado, we're going to get right into it. And we're going to start with the kind of smaller games and work our way up to the bigger ones. So first up on the list is Love Letter. So this is designed by, who is it again? Seiji Kanai. And this was published by AEG. So uh, this was probably one of the first games you know, hobby games I, I owned when I got into board gaming. I've probably had this for about 10 years or so. It's a great little um, card game. There's not not much to it. You basically, everyone has a one card in their hand. There's different roles. Um, like there's like the princess, the baron, uh, the priest and whatnot. And on your turn, you basically draw a card and then you'll have two cards and you play one of your two cards and each of the cards has a different role. And basically you're trying to, the theme is you're trying to get your, your secret letter, uh, your love letter to the princess. Um, they're quick little rounds that each round can take sometimes maybe two, three minutes, five minutes, whatever. And it's the first player to win a certain number of rounds, um, wins the game. So it's kind of a deduction game. The turns are pretty simple, pretty quick. Um, this was a very easy kind of like gateway level game for me when I got into the hobby. <clears throat> I enjoyed playing it quite a bit. It definitely works best at higher player counts with four players, even with three, it's pretty good with two. It's not great. It's okay. It works fine. Um, but it's just a little less interesting. And it's surprising it does hold up for quite a few plays, but I just feel like I'm at a point in the hobby now where, I mean, first off, I it's I can't remember the last time I pulled this off my shelf and played the physical copy. I've maybe played this once in the last like three or four years. I just have so many other small box little card games. Um, again, if I'm talking two players, this is never going to be the game I, I pick. Uh, if I'm going to pick a two player card game, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff like not not talking similar type of game, but like Race for the Galaxy, whatever. But if I'm looking for like a kind of, you know, game that I want to play with other players that's more interactive, three or four players, there's all kinds of stuff. You've got games like Coloretto, For Sale, all these other filler games that I find have everyone a little more involved. Love Letter has a bit of player elimination. Sometimes you can go out, you know, you start the round, you're just sitting there, one player pulls the Baron card and you have to compare cards and theirs is higher than yours and you lose and you're out of the round and you didn't even do anything yet. So it... I think it's just after a while, being in the hobby for a while, having played a lot of games, it eventually wore a little bit thin. I would still play it happily. It's still a fine game, but I think it's a bit long for what it is. If you're looking for something like Love Letter, if you like this one, you want kind of the step up, um, you might want to check out a game called Citadels, which is has a similar thing where you've got these different roll cards and it plays up to even more players. I think it's either six or eight players. Um, there's a decent amount of downtime at times, but uh, it's basically a more interesting, slightly more complex version of Love Letter. So uh, either way, Love Letter is a good game. If you haven't tried it, you can try it out for free on Board Game Arena. Um, but yeah, that one will be leaving my collection. Next up, we've got Gizmos. So this is designed by Phil Walker Harding who also designed uh, Sushi Go, Baron Park. Uh, he recently designed Cloud City, um, as well as Summer Camp, I believe is his newest game. And this is published by Simon Games. So um, we actually did a how to play video and a review of this uh, back when I first got it a while ago. This is a 2018 game and it is basically um, an engine building, tableau building game. 
Uh, the basic theme is that it's the world's greatest science fair and you're trying to compete to, to sort of have the greatest invention at the science fair. So each player has a, a little dashboard that shows their four available actions. You can, you know, there's a, and there's a, a sort of a little tower of these marbles of four different energy types. They're red, yellow, blue, and black. Um, you know, heat, electric, atomic, whatever. And basically there's actions throughout the game where you can be drawing through this from the top of this marble dispenser blind, or there's a little row where these marbles kind of roll out and you can be taking marbles um, that you can see, picking a specific color from the row and you're collecting these sort of energies and keeping them in your little energy ring. And you can take these cards from the tableau and use the energy to pay for them. And the whole game is about these chain reactions. So you start off with your one little basic gizmo card and then there's a tableau of cards or a sort of market of cards that players can buy from. And as you buy these cards, on your turn, doing one single action can sometimes trigger another action, which triggers another one, which changes into this other action. So early in the game, you're doing very little on your turn. You're sometimes just taking an energy here or you're taking this card and putting it in your reserve. And then later in the game, you might be able to hold twice as much energy and you might be, you know, when you pick one of these, it also lets you pick one of these, which also lets you take another one of these uh, energy types, which then lets you build something, which triggers into that. And it's all about this kind of like this, the game has this really interesting arc where you start off so weak and then by the end, you feel like you're doing so much in your turns. Um, and the game has a bit of a race element in, in that sense with, um, you know, when a certain number of cards have been played or built, uh, it triggers the end of the game and whoever has the most points wins. So there's a lot to like about Gizmos. I think it's a really good gateway kind of introduction to those type of um, tableau building or engine building games. For someone who's maybe never played board games before, this might be slightly above gateway maybe. Um, I would compare this, this fall, this is a similar game to kind of like Splendor and the Century games like Century Spice Road and Century Golem. They're those kind of like, you know, on the Board Game Geek weight, they're like 2.0. It's kind of between light and medium, kind of gateway, kind of not. And they're the type of games that fall in this weird range where sometimes for a gateway game, it might be a little complicated for some people. And then sometimes for advanced gamers after 5, 10, 12 plays or whatever, it might feel like it wears a little bit thin. Um, and to me, that's kind of why this is leaving my collection. I've played it now probably 10 or 12 times. I've enjoyed it. I gave it a very positive review. You can go back and check that out. Um, I have very little wrong with the game, very little issues. There's a couple things like after repeat plays, it loses a bit of it, its excitement. Um, the cards I wish had some maybe more identity, like a name on the cards. So you're not just looking at them and trying to figure out, like identify them by the abilities all the time. Um, it just, there's... The game is very clean, it feels very balanced, everything feels like it works well, there's just some some little excitement lacking after I've played it a certain number of times. If I'd only played this like twice, three times, I would not be getting rid of this because I, I liked it enough that I would want to have played it more, but now that I've played it this much, there's too many tableau builders in my collection or engine building games that I prefer, uh, namely my favorite tableau building games are Race for the Galaxy, Res Arcana, and probably innovation. Um, I also really like evolution climate, and these are all kind of a step above gizmos in terms of complexity. So the issue I've found lately is anytime I wanna play a tableau building game, this is never my first, second, or even third choice. I'd be happy to play it again if someone else has it, and I believe my uh, brother-in-law, or I should say brother-in-law-in-law, uh, was probably gonna be buying this from me. So James, if you're watching, um, now's your chance. Let me know if you're interested in gizmos, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a great game, but just one that I don't feel the need to own anymore. That is Gizmos. All right, next up we've got, this one's kind of maybe a half cheating pick and I'll explain why as I go. And I don't, yeah, maybe a half cheating pick. That is Galaxy Trucker. This is designed by Vladik Vatel and published by CGE. So this is the designer who has also done, I mean, is there a more versatile designer in gaming? I, I don't know. Um, Games like Galaxy Trucker, this is a real-time spaceship building game. He's also done uh, Through the Ages, he's done Code Names, he's done Space Alert, all kinds of games. So you might have recently heard there's a new edition of Galaxy Trucker coming out, um, I believe this year, um, if not then early next year, but I believe it's still this year. And basically they're doing a revised kind of second edition. They're going to streamline the game a little more, make the rules a little... Um, uh, make the game a little bit play a little bit quicker maybe a little less complexity to the rules they're trying to make it a more accessible game it's going to have a shorter play time um, and then you can add in the extra length if you'd like so part of the reason this is leaving my collection is because first off 
I've had this for quite a few years. I first played Galaxy Trucker on the Android app. And on the app, there's actually a variant where instead of playing it in real time mode, you can play it where you use these action points and you actually use a certain number of action points to take your actions instead. I played it a whole bunch on there before I got the physical copy of the game because I just loved it. I loved playing it on the app. And then I bought the physical version. I've played it probably six, seven, eight times. Um, and it's just one that I've, I've played it so many times. And to introduce new players, it has a decent amount of rules to get into for like, this is definitely not a gateway game. Um, and also, even if it's not your very first game, it can take a while. It can take hour, hour and a half, sometimes even... The last time I taught a couple new people and we played as a four player game, I think all told it was about two hours. And for this type of game, for this type of kind of, you know, raucous, fun, uh, real time game, I think it runs a bit long sometimes. But the idea in Galaxy Trucker is you're playing three rounds. Every round you are building a spaceship. And then the back half of that round is flying the spaceship through space and going on these little adventures. So, um, the building phases where it's all real time simultaneous, where you have all these face down tiles, everyone has their own little spaceship board. And uh, in round one, you have a small board and then each round you get a bigger board to build a bigger spaceship, but you're basically reaching into the middle, grabbing a tile, flipping it over and seeing if it fits somewhere on your board where you wanna put it. If not, you put it back in the middle and you take a different tile and players are just going rushing, putting these random tiles, flipping around, trying to fit them and build their little spaceship. And you can have, you know, eng like rockets that give you boosts. You can have batteries that allow you to do stuff on your spaceship and blasters to shoot things. And then in the adventure phase of these rounds, you're basically getting shot at in space. You're getting hit by meteors. Pirates are coming after you. You might land on planets that have goods that you can gain that are allow you to get points. One of the things I love about Galaxy Trucker is it says right in the rules that as long as you end the game with positive money, you win. And it says something along the lines of like, who cares if those other bozos had more money than you? So what? It, like, it, so the designer has basically written it in here that like everyone wins as long as you're not broke. As long as you have more than zero, you, you win. And then it's just like, you kind of maybe win a little bit more. So I know people have said, oh, I don't like playing because of oh, the randomness and my spaceship gets destroyed and all this stuff. But like the game isn't, just about one person winning. It's kind of about the experience of everyone going through space, watching people's ships get destroyed. I don't know. This is one of those games that I don't play it specifically to win. Like, yeah, you should be trying to win, but if you don't win, like I've had games of this where I just like, regardless of what happens to my ship or other opponents' ships, we're all just laughing because just seeing the, it's the unpredictability of what's going to happen in that adventure phase after the whole building. Sometimes I don't like the kind of runaway problem where like, let's say, you know, you have, you can be further ahead in the, in space and adventures and your other opponent's ships get demolished. And now every adventure card you get to your first, so you get the, you know, first dib on this, and then you get the next dibs on that. And sure you start to fall behind, but there is, I've had games where the player in the lead tends to feel like they stay in the lead for a while. Um, but ultimately for me, the reason why I'm getting rid of this is just because with this updated version coming out and the fact that I have a couple people I know who probably will buy this from me now that I'm getting rid of it, I'm still going to have access to this game. I'm still going to be able to play it. And if I really want, I might be able to just get that second edition that's coming out um, later this year. So for now, I'm okay with parting the old version. I don't see myself playing it all that much. It's not a must-own game for me. Um, but you know, if you haven't at least tried Galaxy Trucker, I highly recommend it. It is a lot of fun. Just a game that I personally don't feel the need to own anymore. So that is why I will be saying goodbye to Galaxy Trucker. All right. Next up, um, I think I'm going to get some flack for this one, maybe. We'll see. Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. So this is the newest game on the list. This is a 2020 release. Uh, designed by Isaac Childress and Childress, pardon me, and published by Cephalo Fair Games. So the main reason this is leaving my collection is just because, well, I, I beat it. I'm done with it. Um, and there isn't as much to explore in this as there is in, for example, Gloomhaven or another game where there would have been, you know, a whole bunch of unlockable characters and that sort of thing. So um, for those of you who don't know, Gloomhaven Jaws the Lion is basically the prequel version to Gloomhaven, which is this massive big box kind of... Um, you know, a campaign adventure game, a legacy game. 
Jaws of the Lion, rather than taking a semi-cooperative approach, is more of a fully cooperative game. Um, it's scaled down. It's way more of an introductory game. There's kind of tutorials that ease you into it. Um, but the idea is it's from one to four players, and you each pick a character, and you're going on this adventure. You have a series of dungeons or scenarios you have to get through. Sometimes it's just kill all the enemies in the scenario. Sometimes you have to, you know, retrieve items or complete certain tasks. Um, and it uses the same two card system as base Gloomhaven where you're playing two cards and you do the top half of one card and you do the bottom half ability of another card. All the regular Gloomhaven stuff is intact basically, some minor rule changes. Um, as I mentioned, you, you pick one character, you stay with it for the rest of the campaign, there's no retiring characters. There's fewer side quests and stuff, but this is a digestible package. This is, if you want to be able to experience Gloomhaven, you haven't been able to play base Gloomhaven, um, but you want to know what the system has out there, uh, or you, you know, you just want to have that introduction before getting into the big main Gloomhaven game, Jaws the Lion is awesome. There's, I mean, the, the art too, the kind of, um, you know, I wasn't, if you see my review of it, I wasn't maybe fully pulled into the actual narrative, the story of what was happening, but the world itself is immersive. Um, you know, Isaac and his crew have clearly gone through a lot of care to kind of, uh, build up these types of characters and put these little bits of story and, um, kind of world building in the little road events and, you know, intros to the scenarios and little things like that. So I can't say much of the actual story itself has stuck with me since I finished playing it. And I did play through this solo only, playing as two characters. Um, but, you know, there was still, I was still part of this this world. I was still, I still felt like even on the road events, there were very interesting decisions to make. Um, and even though this type of game isn't normally my type of game, and if you had told me a year or two ago uh, that this was coming out, I would have never thought I would play this type of thing solo. But during the pandemic, uh, I decided to play it over the course of a few weeks. I had a great time with it. Um, I just don't see myself going back to it. I went through the whole game playing as two of the characters. The other two are, look interesting enough. I, I like Gloomhaven, but I've played a lot of Gloomhaven and Jaws Line now over the past couple of years that I just, I don't see any reason to go back to this anytime soon. Um, so I will be moving on from this and I specifically avoided, you know, adding all the stickers and doing all the things that makes it, make it uh, impossible to restart from the beginning. So um, great game in terms of other games um, to compare it to. I mean, I don't really know, like other than Gloomhaven, I mean, I've heard of other games like... Uh, like Descent and things like that that are kind of dungeon crawlers or have these type of um, campaign style. But uh, to be honest with you, I, it's, I'm not getting rid of this because of another campaign game replacing it. It's just one that I have no use for uh, to play myself. So that is Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Fantastic game. All right, next up is another big one. Um, this is one that's been in my collection for a long time. And for a long time, I thought I would never get rid of. This is... Aeon's End. <clears throat> this is designed by uh, Kevin Riley, I believe it is. Yes, Kevin Riley, and this is published by uh, Indie Boards and Card. So Aeon's End is uh, also a one to four player game, like Jaws of the Lion. Um, this is a cooperative deck building game. So um, it's honestly the game I would compare it most to from what I've played would be Marvel Champions, which if you are familiar with our channel, obviously uh, Dylan does a whole bunch of Marvel Champions content. Kind of similar games in one in 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 some ways. The main difference I would say is that Marvel Champions your is a deck construction game where you build your deck um, before going into your battle, but you're picking a hero and you're picking a villain or a series of heroes or whatever, and you're going to fight against a villain. This is a similar thing. It's kind of a post-apocalyptic theme. Uh, it's the city of Gravehold is the last remaining city, and there are you you represent. You're playing as a, a mage or a breach mage, they call it, um, who's basically tasked with defending the city of Gravehold and defeating the nemesis um, that you're up against. So. Uh, similar to Marvel Champions, you pick uh, a mage for yourself, each player picks one, and then you're playing against the nemesis, but instead of constructing a deck before the game starts, it's a deck building game, so everyone starts with a basic deck of 10 cards, similar to like in Dominion if you've played, um, or Hero Realms, Star Realms, those kind of basic deck builders. So you start with a deck of basic cards, and then you have a market of cards, so throughout the game you're actually buying the cards that go into your deck to build your deck as you go. So that's the main difference between this and Marvel Champions. I really like Aeon's End. I've had a lot of fun with it over the years. There's there's so much cool stuff in here. I mean, first off, the fact that it's a cooperative deck building game. At the time, I, there weren't a whole lot of these um, as far as I knew. 
There's a couple other cool things it does. One is that in a lot of deck building games, you're shuffling your deck um, after your discard pile empty, or after your deck empties into your discard pile, you're shuffling it to redo it. In this game, anything that goes into your discard pile, when your deck is empty, you just flip the discard pile over and start drawing again. And at the end of your turn, when you have your cards that you've played, you choose what order they go into the discard pile. So there's a bit of, you have a bit of control over how the cards go into your discard pile. And then when the deck flips, you can kind of try to clump certain cards together so that you have a bit more control maybe over your combos. Um, another thing is because the theme of the, you're these breach mages, the spell cards that you play, there's three types of cards in the game. There's the money cards, the ether or whatever you call it that allows you to buy new cards. There's relics, which are just kind of like actions that resolve immediately. But then you have spells and a spell, you play it and it doesn't resolve immediately. You have to attach it to one of your breaches and you have open and closed breaches. And if a breach is closed, then you have to actually have focused it. Won't get into the rest of that really to attach a spell, but if, if it's open, you can attach it. And then on following turns is when you can actually release that spell. So not only is there a bit of timing in terms of you're putting spells out to use on later turns, but then that also messes with the configuration of the cards that again, go into your discard pile and order around your deck. So there's a lot of cool stuff. The base game comes with, I think, eight mages, and I think there's four bosses. Um, oh, here's the, here's the other thing, actually, that I want to touch on about Aeon Zen that sets it apart, is the turn structure. So regardless of player count, every round works with six turns. So the nemesis is always going to get two turns, and then depending on player count, you're going to have these player cards... Um, shuffled into determines. So let's say if you're playing with two players, you're going to have two of these player one cards and two of these player two cards and then two of the nemesis cards. So every round you're shuffling them up and you flip a card and it'll say nemesis. So it's the nemesis turn. Then you flip another one. If it's nemesis again, the nemesis goes again. So every round there's going to be six turns and you know whose turns are going to happen, but you don't know in which order. So as you're flipping, you kind of figure out the order that the turns are going to play out. This plays into the turn, uh, or the player count, and this is part of the reason, a big reason I would say why I'm getting rid of this game, is that I no longer have any interest in playing Aeon's End with three or four players. Um, I didn't realize that when I first bought it and first started playing it, but... So because of that turn structure, with four players, you have those two Nemesis cards in still, but then there's one card each for players one, two, three, and four. So every round in a four-player game, you're getting one turn out of six, whereas every round in a two-player game, you're getting two turns out of six. So right there, you're basically, your personal playing time is cut in half when you're playing with four players instead of two. The other thing is, because the game still goes at a similar speed, each player just does less, each player buys fewer cards from the market, so each player is a little bit weaker, so it's a longer game, there's more kind of, more people to communicate with and figure stuff out with, but I don't feel there's you don't get the return on that investment. I just feel like adding more players doesn't make the game better. Everyone's a little less involved. Everyone's a little weaker. The game gets harder too, and which is fine. I don't mind the added challenge, but not at the expense of people being less involved. Three players would normally be okay in the middle, but then the problem is that for that turn structure thing with the rounds, you get a, uh, the two nemesis cards, and then you get a player one, a player two, and a player three card, but then there's a wild card. And I found that what ends up happening is when that wild comes up, there's always a discussion about, oh, well, who, who should get the extra turn this round? And someone's like, oh, well, if I take the extra turn, I can do this, which will be pretty useful. And then someone's like, well, if I take the extra turn, then I can... And then eventually we end up just going, oh, okay, whoever wants it really. Or sometimes there's a clear, you know, player that it makes more sense to give that extra turn to. But the issue is then they got two turns that round, whereas the other players each got one. So now they're kind of already stronger. And then sometimes, depending on what nemesis you're against, it might make sense to just keep powering up that other player. And then in the next rounds, think, well, if they're already so strong. If I take the extra turn, I'm not going to be able to do much. But if we give them two turns, they already bought those extra cards. They can do more. So then it feels like you want to just keep feeding in and letting that person keep taking the extra turn every round. But then they're taking more turns and playing more of the game. So... To me, I don't really like the game much with three or four players for those reasons. I've played it enough solo. I've played it again. I've tried against all the nemesis, uh, nemeses, I should say, uh, in here enough. I don't feel the need to go back to it solo. And then where it plays best as a two-player game, I just have so many other two-player games that I would rather have um, hit the table ahead of Aeon's End, especially because there's a decent amount of setup time too for this. You got to set up the market of cards that you're going to do. Then you got to put together the Nemesis deck following this little chart. You've got all these different dividers and compartments and whatever. So I feel like this was the perfect game for me when I first discovered it, probably in my early 20s. I had a lot more time on my hands. I only had maybe six, seven, eight games in my collection. I've gotten a lot of play out of this. Everyone I've shown this to over the years has really enjoyed it. It's a great game. Uh, there's a couple expansions in this box as well. 
And to be honest, um, I'm not completely done with Aeon Zen. I would gladly play it again if someone else had it. And I might even explore, there's other, there's Aeon Zen Legacy, there's Aeon Zen War Eternal and New Age and all these different versions of it. So I think I'll probably revisit the Aeon Zen system at some point, but I mean, look at the size of the box, right? It's one of the bigger boxes on my shelf. It sits there mostly unplayed. And because of, again, my issues with some of the player counts, it's just, it's one that I'm gonna have to event, uh, at this point finally move on from but I've had a great time with it and if you haven't picked it up or checked it out yet and you're looking for a cooperative deck builder I do highly recommend you check out Aeon's End. All right and the last game I am getting rid of this time I don't know how I'm even gonna get this box in here let's try and make some room it is Seal Team Flicks by Pete Ruth and Mark Thomas uh, this is a game of tactical dexterity, a cooperative tactical dexterity game, uh, to be precise. It's published by WizKids. So, as you can see, this box is massive. Um, what is a cooperative tactical dexterity game? Well, think of, um, if you're familiar with the video games, things like um, uh, Splinter Cell, um, Metal Gear Solid, that type of stuff where you're kind of like sneaking around, infiltrating, trying to save hostages, defuse bombs, that kind of stuff, trying not to be detected, you know. Um, imagine that in board game form cooperatively, but the dexterity part comes into place because this is a flicking game, hence the name SEAL Team Flicks. So the game comes with these little discs and you have these figurines on a map. Um, the game comes with six maps that you have to put together. Um, it takes a while to actually put them together with all the glue and punching all the, the boards out and everything. Um, but basically the game comes with standalone missions or you can do a, a, like a campaign mode that you pick a character. Um, you play this as with one to four players and you basically try to play through a campaign. Um, but if you lose a mission, your character actually dies and you have to kind of start over. So it's a pretty tough, um, unforgiving game, but you're basically going through these scenarios where there'll be objectives. Um, you know, they're kind of, there's a certain randomness to how the, the levels are populated. There's these little tokens that get spread out that can either like generate noise or it can be a hostage or it can be whatever, different types of bad guys. And the idea is you're navigating these rooms, trying to complete these objectives, solve these, or, you know, complete these missions. Um, and you're eliminating guys, eliminating tangos or killing bad guys by flicking these little discs at them. So honestly, it's a combination I never thought I would um, hear of or see, see in a game. I heard a lot about this on uh, the So Very Wrong About Games podcast um, for a little while. And I, I just, I had, to, I had to try it for myself. I saw this for a fairly cheap. And of all the games I've mentioned so far on this list, this was the one I was talking about that I haven't played much of. All the other games I've gone over, I've played probably at least eight or 10 times minimum. This one I've only played twice, I believe. Um, I, I really, there, there's nothing quite like this game. I, Dylan and I brought it out to the cabin once. We were able to try it and it is a lot of fun. There's a lot of cool moments. There's, you know, the way that you kind of sit there and you, you can observe the map and you kind of try and spot these opportunities and figure out how are you going to, you know, you have to come up with a plan. So there's some strategy to it. It calls it a tactical game, but there is some strategy at the start of figuring out what's my plan. How am I going to try and get to that spot and rescue that person? Or where are we going to navigate through? Which rooms are we going to go through here? But then every, every round things change. The, the, the game state changes, you know, you fire at someone and there's noise, more people are attracted. Suddenly there's more guys around. Um, and then you have to keep deciding, are you going to take cover behind something? What type of shot are you going to fire? Are you going to shoot with a shotgun? Are you going to try and throw a grenade? There's all kinds of stuff that comes into play and everything you do in the game pretty much, again, has to do with flicking these discs. And they even incorporate the flicking mechanic with things like bomb defusal. So there's these little sideboards where when you have to defuse a bomb, you pull out this little sideboard and there's a little target and you basically have to hit these little targets by flicking discs. And that's how you determine whether or not you successfully defuse the bomb. So there's these little like mini games that also incorporate the flicking. It's not just for flicking them to hit the bad guys around the map. So it is, I mean, if you look at even just the, the, <clears throat> the artwork on the cover and uh, the artwork and the rules and stuff, like it is kind of... Like, yeah, it's the SEAL team kind of, you know, theme, but it, it is kind of goofy. It is kind of silly. Like, obviously, you're, you're flicking discs um, in this, like, infiltration uh, game trying to rescue hostages and stuff. Like, obviously, it's very silly. What prevented me from being able to enjoy this more or get it back to the table again is there are some rules issues. I mean, first off, the rules are pretty complicated. Um... I had to read through the rule book once. I still didn't fully get everything or memorize everything. So it involved actually setting up the game, 
running through some moves. Then I still had some questions, found out there's some either errors or inconsistencies in the rule books. So there's like errata online on the Steel Team Flicks uh, Board Game Geek page. There's some good threads there that have little like um, player aids and cheat sheets and things that you can use to kind of help get a hang of the rules. But even so, while playing, you know, there's certain parts in the rulebook where it says one thing and then in another part it kind of says something that contradicts it or is confusing. So I found there was a lot of these cases where I was unsure, I had to go online. And as I mentioned at the start of the video, I'm going to be a dad soon. Um, my, my time is getting more precious. And since I've played this about five, six months ago, I've already forgotten most of the rules again. The idea of relearning the rules refamiliarizing myself with the you know potential uh, errata or rules corrections thinking about teaching a new person the game again and then playing it once or twice and then what if it doesn't hit or what if we don't want to go back and continue that campaign it's not a game i would want to play i think as a three or four player game solo would probably work well but the idea of sitting there flicking and making these nice shots and having no one around just made me a little sad to think about doing that so i was like pretty insistent on playing it as a two-player game but again, when you're with two players, there's already other two player games you don't get to play as often. And again, with the rules kind of overhead and everything, it just falls into this spot where I can't see myself playing this game in the next year or two, at least, maybe even longer. And realistically, if I come back to this in three, four years or longer, it's going to be even more new to me. There's going to be even more, you know, having to relearn all the rules and stuff. Um, so yeah, it falls under it, it. This one feels almost like maybe not a missed opportunity, but I kept this one on my shelf for so long because the potential of the game was there. Um, the other thing that's keeping me from keeping this in my collection is I don't like to keep a whole lot of games. I think my collection's floating somewhere around a hundred games right now, which I mean, to some of you might sound ridiculous, might sound like a lot, but compared to a lot of other people on the internet who are making board game videos, it's not a lot of games. Trust me. But look at the size of this. The box doesn't even close properly because you have to assemble these maps and then you, I don't want to stand the game up on its side so it has to sit on my shelf in this weird way but then I can't put anything on top because of the way the maps are built. It's just, there's all these little things about it that just, it, it feels like it just doesn't belong in my collection anymore. If you've never played it and you have someone who's willing to teach you the rules or, you know, if, if you're maybe younger than I am and you have a lot more time on your hands, like I could see if I was like in my teenage years or maybe like early 20s and I was going, you know, out for a weekend at a cabin with a friend who really wanted to dive into this, like there's a lot of good stuff here. It's just for me and where I'm at in my life, um, I'm just kind of past being able to get into this type of game right now, I think. And if I am going to, um, they've actually, what was going to be an expansion um, pack for this game, they've kind of converted some of that into a new game they're developing called Phantom Division, which is supposed to be coming out either in 2021 or 2022 uh, by the same designers and publisher. So keep an eye out for Phantom Division as well if you're interested, or um, you can start off with Seal Team Flicks. So that one will be leaving my collection. And that is the final one. So those are the six games that I am culling from my collection this time. Uh, tough decisions. Again, some of these have been in my collection for a long time. Some of them were former favorite games. Aeon Zen used to be my favorite deck building game. Um, there's some, you know, these are both cooperative games. I guess three cooperative games here, I just realized. Galaxy Trucker, I've had a blast playing. But, you know, uh, as you play more and more games and you try to spend more time playing the games that you like most, um, sometimes you got to make these decisions. And, uh, yeah, um, I'm hope I don't regret any of these. What do you think? Do you think I'm going to regret any of these? Uh, are there any games here that you think I'm nuts for getting rid of? Any of these that you think um, I totally am, you know, right on the money with getting rid of? Do you have any good alternatives to any of these that you'd want to suggest that you think might hit the mark more for me or might still have a place in my collection? Uh, let me know. Always interested to hear from you guys. Um, we'll do, you know, more of these videos whenever either myself or Dylan, one of us has some of these games to get rid of. Uh, if there's anything else you'd like us to, to see us incorporate into the format of these videos or anything else you'd like to see us cover, just let us know. Otherwise, that is it for now. So thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.